All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to another Spotlight session on February 12th. Uh, today we have presenting is uh, Dr. Mayhill Fowler. Uh, the uh, title of this presentation will be Sashka in Kabul, Women, War, and Untrue War Stories at the Theater of the Carpathian Military District in Uyghur, I believe. I Did I completely shred that? It's uh, so great. So great. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, great. So um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, it's just wonderful to see your names and your squares. Thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you to the Brown Center for organizing this opportunity, which is off kilter in time, because I teach at the normal spotlight time um, and in format. I wanted to write a paper and talk about it. Um, uh, because in, in Spree's, we're starting something called Research Kitchen. Um, since we have a critical mass of people who work on this crazy, fascinating place, we wanted to know more about what we're all up to. Um, so I wrote this paper and I, and I hope we can um, talk about it. I also want to thank Stetson for the year of leave from service and teaching. It was really, really important for me to have a year and I'm happy to talk more about why that is. Um, and I want to thank Fulbright for um, funding the research year. It was crucial for me to have Fulbright. And I have to say, even though I know Ukraine, I know Ukrainian, I have contacts, networks, everything, having that Fulbright made a difference. Um, it really meant that I had an office in Kiev to support me and a, a little Fulbright ID. Um, and that really opened a lot of doors for me. So um, I do want to talk about the paper, but I want to frame it a little bit for those of you who may not have read it. And I'm going to actually um, share, let's see if I can do this, share my screen. Well, not my screen, the file. Here we go. Excellent. We see that? Yes. Yeah. Assuming we do. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is my um, sabbatical project. Um, it is a book called War Stories, Theater on the Front Lines of Socialism, which is a biography of a theater that is pictured right here in the city of Lviv. It's a biography of the texts, people, buildings, infrastructures, artists, and audiences that make up a theater. It's also actually not the book I'm writing right now. Um, I would like to highlight that my sabbatical and Fulbright was in the now infamous 2019-2020 cohort. Um, the archives closed in March. Fulbright ended very suddenly. And I actually spent nearly three months stuck in Ukraine. There's worse places to be stuck to be sure, um, but it's, it's, a, it's traumatic um, to, be, to be stuck outside your home country, as is having to shift your entire research program. Um, I was unable to finish the research for this book and I had to do a huge pivot. And so, because I would like to go up for a full professor before my next sabbatical, so I'm actually writing a book called Comrade Actress, Soviet Ukrainian Women on the Stage and Behind the Scenes for which I have done the research. So that's the book I'm trying to complete right now. Um, but I hope to finish the research for this book on war stories in the next few years and um, keep it going. So I've tried to create sort of deadlines and opportunities to keep this book um, uh, going, hence this um, paper um, that you read. So um, as I mentioned, I will be giving a talk based on this paper at the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard, and I would love help with it. So let me tell you a little bit sort of about um, the project. This is the biography of a theater and a very interesting one. Um, this is the originally the theater of the Kiev military district founded in 1931, directly after the founding of the theater of the Soviet army in Moscow in 1929. Um, it was a Russian language theater for young people performing for the army uh, in the 30s. Um, during the war, it became a frontline theater and it really became a frontline theater. They were very much performing under gunfire. Um, you can see this sort of photo from the war um, there. They were then moved to Odessa after the war. And in 1954, um, largely to reinforce Soviet power in the Western Ukrainian regions. These are regions that had been part of Poland, um, were taken over by the Soviets in 1939 as part of the Hitler-Stalin pact, um, and then given to Stalin um, in the conferences at the end of World War II. So it's, these are sort of newly Soviet regions, and there was a Ukrainian nationalist movement in the region um, until the early 1950s um, at the earliest. 
Um, so kind of bringing Russian language military theater to the region was um, very important. And they moved in 1944, uh, 1954, um, and had some trouble um, getting an audience in Western Ukraine, but they eventually did. And they did with war stories. And this theater told war stories um, for its entire career, such as this one called Barabanchitsa, Little Drummer Girl, um, which was the first big hit of the theater and the first big hit for this actress pictured here, Zinaida Dikaryova, who was one of the big divas um, of the theater. Um, we see another photo from the production here. She's a, um, the play takes place right after um, a town is liberated by the Soviets and everybody thinks that she was sleeping with the enemy and working for the Gestapo, but of course it turns out she was the biggest partisan spy ever and she dies at the end. And this was a photo I talked about at the end of the paper. You can see it's a very kind of sexualized image and we're sort of meant to understand that she was sleeping with um, with the enemy, um, as we see in her in her dress um, here. So they do war stories. Um, uh, World War II was their bread and butter. Um, obviously, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Ukrainian army decided they didn't want to support Russian language Soviet military theater. Um, but the theater never collapsed, actually. It sort of surfs a bunch of different um, patrons. And it ended up on the budget of the Lviv City Council with a couple of other theaters. And it is today a Lviv City Theater um, funded by the city um, and run by a very dynamic team of largely young women. Um, so it's not a military theater, but it's a, it's a very interesting kind of avant-garde hip space um, and uh, is doing really interesting work. It's called Teatr Lassi um, after Lesi Ukrenka, who's a very famous um, early 20th century Ukrainian language Russian imperial writer. Um, and so it's this biography of this theater that I'm, that I'm telling. And um, over several chapters, I'm interested in three things in this book. I'm interested in um, rethinking culture in Ukraine. I mean, we're always rethinking things as scholars. Um, and Ukraine has been rethought at several important um, moments, of course, but time to rethink again. I think Ukraine is so often the stepchild of Eastern European history, which is largely Polish or Czech, and the stepchild of Russian Imperial Soviet history, which is so often Russian, the Central Asians are off doing their own thing. And actually Ukraine is this really interesting cultural space. I think that not only offers a view on other spaces, but connects. And when you look at individual lives or indeed individual theaters, you see that the scholarly categories that we come up with don't actually work. I'm also interested in um, institutions and people. As historians, we're trained very much to look at institutions. And actually, as I get older, I become much more interested in people and individual lives. And this is kind of less in the paper, but this is, I think, part of, of what I'm really interested in as a scholar right now. Um, and the real thing I'm, I'm, I'm really driven by in my work right now is about how we create stories and how we create narratives. Um, and there's three reasons for this. One is, I think, I think what this book is about is how when as a theater you stop telling good stories, you die, which sounds like super unscholarly, but um, that when you stop telling stories that resonate, that are real on some level, whether it's entertainment or speaking to only one group, whatever, when you stop telling good stories, you lose it. And that's essentially what happened to this theater. They stopped telling any stories that resonated and they um, kind of died. Um, but the second reason storytelling is really interesting to me is that when I was in Ukraine, um, as you know, or you may not, you know, war has been going on in Ukraine since 2014. And I've watched, I've literally watched that narrative be created. Um, not only talking to my friends um, and, and, you know, reading, reading stuff and hearing people position themselves in relation to the war and the war in relation to them, um, but I've seen that narrative show up in books and in movies and in theater. And I went to the theater probably 50 times before COVID last year. And, and so often I would be reading about war stories, you know, in the archives and then sitting in a theater and like, oh my gosh, here we go again, another play about war. Okay. So it's like watching as you're reading about the construction of a war narrative, watching a narrative about war be created. And that was a really powerful experience. 
And finally, I think it's just, it's fascinating how we're telling stories of the pandemic right now. We're living in a historical moment. We're living in this incredibly traumatic conjuncture and we're creating a narrative of it um, as we speak. So in the paper, um, I'm looking at how the war stories they were telling stopped relating to war and how putting women in focus actually so often shows what's not told, right? Shows, shows the untold um, in a war story. And in the paper, I talk about how these stories are made in the military entertainment complex. Um, and I have some great photos here I'd like to share. These are from a private collection. This is Diktaryova, this big actress. Arkadiev, another big actor. And you can see there just out with the soldiers and brass from the military district. Um, here's another one. There's been some presentation um, here. We can see the top brass here as well. Um, here they're all on a tour in um, Czechoslovakia in 1959. Um, and here they are, here's Tikhariova again, performing. And you can see they really are performing right for the garrison, uh, garrison troops. Um, and there I go into some specifics of how this theater um, works um, in the paper. And I looked at the play um, Sashka, um, which is by Kondratyov, a 1979 short story. Um, produced in, in 1983, which is about Sashka, um, who's right here and very morose, um, who is moral, who is Soviet humanism embodied, who has the soul of a poet. Um, so it's very much not about vanquishing the fascists. In fact, the German doesn't die in the play, um, but it's about the morality of the Soviet soldier, the moral, the morality of the Soviet people um, and not the killing of Germans. And there are encounters with women in the play that kind of help that come through, right? So we see Zina here, who is um, faithless um, to our poor Sashka and, and ends up with a, um, a more ranked officer. Um, there's Pasha here, who opens her hearth and her bed to Sashka. Um, and there are some other women um, uh, at the end of the play who are sort of coiffed and have manicures and are sort of talking about, oh my God, you know, you're, you're just coming back from the front and we're going there. Um, and so these women um, allow us to see Sashka as this uh, moral Soviet um, patriot. And of course, during this time, there's no play about the war in Afghanistan. And you might say, well, I mean, yeah, there's like, to they're totally different wars, but it really bothers them. And a lot of the meetings of the Artistic Council at this time are about how can we call ourselves a military theater and support our troops if we're not doing a play about Afghanistan? That's where our boys are going and we're not doing a play about it. So there's a great effort to find a play. Um, and as I go through in the paper, they fail to find a play that is appropriate. And when they go to Afghanistan, they do a concert program, right? They're not actually doing um, a war story. And I'm interested in how in these war plays, there are, there are very few women or women are not at the center of the story. And interestingly, um, for people who don't know, um, at least 900,000, some say a million Soviet women served in the war um, and in the Soviet Union, women served in combat roles. And other historians have talked about how that memory really is erased um, at the end of, of the war. Veterans were male and women were supposed to um, have children and, and support men in order to um, bring about recovery in the Soviet Union. Um, and in the late Soviet period with Glasnost, but more actually with the approaching of the 40th anniversary of victory, there's a shift and there are plays that feature women's stories. And I talk about two, Widow's Boat and um, The Unwomanly Face of War, which are very specifically about um, women's experiences and, and um, as I say in the paper, I think this literary director was interested in for this theater, but, but they didn't do. Um, so the theater um, ultimately um, collapses, hobbles along, but finds an audience, um, again, in its incarnation as Teatro Lassi. And again, much of their repertory and the contemporary theatrical landscape in Ukraine is about war stories about the current war in Ukraine's East. Um, this is a photo from a play um, about miners 
in Donbass. And the whole point is, you know, we're at war and we don't know about these people in the East. And so it's a, um, a play about learning about um, miners and Donbass. Um, this is a play called Time Travelers about when, is the, when did the war begin? Um, where is the beginning of the war? And I mentioned in the paper two other plays, H Effect and Pohani Dorohi Bad Roads, that are, um, especially Pohani Dorohi, kind of mainstream culture now. It's a film, actually, completely about um, women's experience in war. So there's lots of war stories today, lots of stories about women, although I don't think that there are stories about, and I can't imagine a story actually about, say, um, a woman in the Ukrainian nationalist underground during World War II. There are still stories that are taboo, that are stories that are, that are, that are not told. Um, and I think what I'm really interested in is how the stories we tell and the stories we don't tell, tell us about society, right? I mean, I think that's what this project is really getting at. And I look forward to talking more. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for listening. I know Katya has prepared some comments, so hopefully we can hear from her and then hopefully we can hear from other people. Thank you for listening. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Nahil for sharing her draft with us and for her willingness to discuss the work that is not um, polished. I think that actually takes a lot of courage, right, to unveil this, you know, disjointed parts that would become, absolutely would become a seamless narrative later, but it takes courage and, you know, this certain <coughs> embrace of vulnerability, I think perhaps is a marker of a different perspective you're advocating for in your uh, <coughs> writing. Okay, so, um, I will start my remarks with disclosing the main points of contention that always existed between us. So unlike <laughs> fake bourgeoisie who do the pleasantries, comrades go straight at it. So, right, comrade Katya will do that. So your research, uh, and I'm referring to this point of contention as far as our approaches to culture are concerned. You always um, focused on periphery. While for better or worse, I always privileged the center. And I'm using those terms, periphery and center, only in the context of the Soviet Union, not in the contemporary context in any way, right? Um, yes, and even though those approaches are certainly deeply interconnected, the accents are different, right? And while reading um, your draft, it seemed to me that your narrative actually uh, could benefit a little bit from uh, situating your discussion of prequa in more so in all union context. Okay, and I will provide like some examples. Uh, for example, on page six, discussing the myths associated with theater, you write. But the other myth is that the theater was uh, really bad since it offered Russian language culture in Ukrainian language live. But my question is, weren't all um, military theater in general, uh, regardless of their location, considered to be a bit subpar? For example, let's take the flagman, of course, Moscow, the Red Theater. They do have a cool building, which looks like a star, you know, uh, the theater did give a jump star to many Soviet stars, like my favorite Faina Ranevska, but the moment they would get noticed, they would jump ship. So it wasn't considered to be a theater for like best talent. Those theaters enjoy perks like financing. And I love the quote that you give in your draft and in 1985 they're requesting this extravagant sum for staging a play and finally the officials are saying this theater has not been counting money for a long time and i'm like reading it and i'm thinking shit soviet union entered really difficult times right i mean that's it military is counting money it's all going to collapse soon and it did right but they enjoy they enjoy that um financing but at the same time because of that particular jurisdiction, they cannot take risks, which is important, mm 
-hmm. for any art. So, you know, I'm wondering what you think about that, that of course your story about your theater is more complicated because of this ethnic component. But generally the standing of military theater, right? They were not avant-garde, they were not talked about. I mean, they were solid like a table, but you know, interesting, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I can just respond to that right away. I mean, I think that's a really uh -huh. good point. And I think for everyone listening, this is a, um, you know, bridging an eight year conversation that Katya and I have been having about, <laughs> about um, center and, and, and periphery. And, and I should also say too, because I know we have some students here as well, that what your sources are shapes your project. And in fact, when I first started working on this project, which was like, you know, you have to have that second book project when you're on the job market which is like so aspirational. And it was this project, but it was a Soviet project. And it was based on my um, absurd belief that I could get into the Ministry of Defense archive outside Moscow, where all these files are, right? And I can't get in. I couldn't have gotten in then, and I certainly can't get in now. No one's, I mean, certainly no Americans are getting in that archive. And I'm certainly, with all my Ukraine stamps, I'm never getting in that archive. Um, and what happened was that it turns out the files on this particular theater were never sent to Moscow. They're in Ukraine, so I can read them. And so by the nature of sort of what I was able to look at and the war and spending a lot of time in Ukraine, it became much more a project about Lviv and about theater in Lviv versus, versus Moscow. And so um, Russians can go there either. Yeah, totally, right? Um, and so, so that, that periphery is there and, and you're right. I think I do need to look at that larger context. I actually think the, um, the Soviet army theater in, in Moscow is one of the good theaters. And I think the, the reality is by the post-war period, any state theater is an avant-garde. They're all kind of walking the line. They have to do certain percentages of certain plays and repertory. They have a lot of um, boxes they have to check. Mm -hmm. In Moscow, you do get, and you don't get this in Ukraine, you do get things like the Severomianik in 1970, mm -hmm. run by Yuri Efremov. You do get the Taganka, mm -hmm. right? Yuri Lubimov, which are um, tolerated. And, and, yeah. and actually state people go a lot because it's really good work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're right, that is not the Soviet Army Theater. They are not doing Yuri Lubimov mm -hmm. costumes, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, so there may be kind of a, regardless of everything, military theater is kind of um, lesser. But what was interesting for me in these comments that people made was that there's this assumption of like, oh, it's the Moscow Art Theater. And I'm like, there's no uh -huh. Moscow Art Theater here. Like, what are you people talking uh -huh. about? These are Ukrainians, right, uh, who are involved in this theater. There's no Moscow Art. So these sort of assumptions that people have about, about a theater and about what like Russian culture is I think is really interesting and, and means that this theater falls into this total historiographic black hole, even though everyone who worked with it is still living in Lviv or Kiev, right? So, I, so, um, but yes, obviously, all union context, obviously, you know, it's good. It's good to drag me out of the periphery a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's my job. <laughs> okay, and um, also you're right uh, about like. Um, you make an argument that by 1970s, women were mothers or wives, and the true heroes were men. And here I also think that uh, you would benefit from considering um, first a novel, then it would become a play staged by Lubimov on Taganka, in Taganka theater, and then the movie, Azores de Stihi, the dawns are quiet yeah, here. Yeah, because yeah. that was all and you know the the uh, novel was published in 1969 Lubimov staged the play in 1971 so that's you know and you write it yeah. yourself right like multiple war stories were staged documented books published but only several of them stood out yeah. that play, like that yeah. novel that movie and that play they stood out Right. Yeah. I mean, to point that the movie was nominated for an Oscar, it yeah. would be its honor, maybe, but still, you know, even like uh, capitalists saw 
um, something special about it. And that particular story actually, you know, tells about the sacrifice of those women who yeah, are not, yeah. you know, there to feed qua soldiers. Right. right. And they feature yeah. women belonging to different stratas, like a Jewish girl from Moscow yeah. intelligentsia yeah. family. Yeah. yeah. Um, beautiful Zhenya, who mm -hmm. was a daughter like of Soviet high ranking officer, like a peasant girl and so forth. Right. And it's a very complex story. And they all die uh, yeah. in the end. Yeah, Only too. actually a guy survives. And yes, even though in the end he says, like, you know, I wish like they would also, you know, they would all leave they would be happy as mother wives and stuff like that but they what i'm saying is like before alexievich yeah. that uh stories were told and yeah. even though there were not a lot of them because i absolutely agree with you those war stories were constructed by men and right. with particular ideals put in right. forefront but at the same yeah. time that particular story was there and be and it became sensational for the soviet spectators right and very yeah. much like part of uh soviet myth about the war so i think you know like yeah. there is a gap here like with alexievich you yeah, know? yeah yeah no um, i think i think you're right and it's and it's interesting too that like that 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 play doesn't even come into discussion for Prikvo or any of the military theaters right they're not doing that so exactly yeah. Taganka is doing that Taganka, Lidima yeah. is doing yeah. that right yeah. so um yeah and uh to open up the discussion to everyone I have like one last thing about Afghanistan and uh the difficulty of telling this story well because officially and I also think all union context matters here because officially yeah. it was not a war in Afghanistan the soldiers right. were serving international duty international right. door. it was a war in the kitchen right it was a war then the mothers were talking just not afghan do not send my kid there right yeah. but then the bodies of those boys were coming back to soviet union they were not buried as people who died at the war as he yeah. war heroes they were buried like and it was kind of a ceremony that was not military it was prohibited to put in their tombstones that they died in afghanistan right yeah. i mean they were given no military like send off nothing so yeah. in that like all situation how can you tell a story yeah. about the war if you don't recognize it as a war so i think that yeah. you know that uh, also kind of colors the narrative. Absolutely. And isn't it then, isn't it, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. And isn't it so bizarre that they're all sitting around being like, yeah, we really need to do a play about this. And you're, you're right. And you're like, you guys. You know. Right. But the play they are selecting, it's like a convoluted play that features yes. like Afghan that side and that side, because Russia is not the side officially. Right. They're helping whatever those revolutionaries who asked us to come here. We are not at war. Right. And that's, you know, that makes it impossible to tell a war story if you don't right. recognize that there is a war. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So yes. I think totally. that that's, you know, and also people, you know, who are participating at war, they don't want to look you know, at war no. stories. They do want they to entertain don't. as Americans wanted to look at Marilyn Monroe rather yeah. than, you know, somebody, you know, teaching them yeah. about war. It's like right now, if somebody would give us a lecture about Zoom, like I would want to strangle that person, right? Because right. I don't want to hear Zoom stories. So, right. you know. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I love that. Pure love psychology. That. <laughs> so should we um, open it up to other yeah. people? Mm -hmm. Will someone run like saying who's going to talk? Or do I do that? Um, I'm happy to. Uh, the <clears throat> Hi, May Hill. It's Melinda. Um, Hi, Melinda. <laughs> sorry about that, as I just speak up as a disembodied voice. Um, so the first hand that I had seen, although he's now um, lowered it, uh, was Michael. Michael Denner. Yeah, there we go. So, Michael, okay. um, you were first. Do you want to go ahead? Michael, can you unmute? Is he muted? Hey, uh, I, I just, I just, I, I, I want to be visible. Uh, I also, awesome. I, I kind of lowered my hand because I'm, I was 
trying to figure out how to ask this question so it wasn't a typical academic question, which always turns into a, a long soliloquy about um, one's own interests and doesn't have anything to do with uh, with the project at hand. And I wasn't able to do that, but so I'll try to ask you a question. So uh, you don't pitch this particular project as a feminist project. Uh, at, at least it doesn't. It doesn't. It, you don't billboard that as as um, the approach. But um, it, it occurs to me, and, and, and this is my own Tolstoyan thinking, uh, that um, how how uh, theater as a spectacle, as a as a, an event, relies largely on feminine labor um, that goes um, almost uh, completely unacknowledged. And I have in mind here just sort of this material culture that's part of, of concurrent feminist philosophy. Um, and I wonder if you would say a few things about the difficulty or possibility of studying um, um, the feminine, the material uh, in theater studies and in, in particular in your project. Sure, that's a that's a big um, a big a big thing, and um, as you notice from my outline, this 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 project itself isn't necessarily about gender. I have a planned chapter on it, um, but this struck me as a really interesting aspect of these war stories, and I am working on this book on comrade actress, which is very much about how the stories of actresses are sidelined in theater history, and actually directly addresses some of the issues, Michael, that you were just talking about. Um, in researching Soviet actresses when the narratives become very troped. And even when you read memoirs or private letters, um, they don't talk about certain things. And in fact, um, in an article I, I just wrote, um, I have a wonderful quote by a woman who says, you know, I, I, never, I never asked, I would never have asked about these things. And so, and people just didn't ask. You didn't ask. Everyone had some skeletons in the closet and you just didn't ask. And so I can only talk about what I saw myself. Um, and what that means is a lot of everyday life gets undiscussed and, and unavailable to the researcher. And then there are things we don't know. And, um, and what do you do about these things that we don't know? Theater scholars um, working on women in say British theater history make an argument that actually all the sources are there, people just haven't looked at them. And that argument is made brilliantly. I don't have the sources, they're not there. Um, and for this particular theater, actually this actress I showed you, Zinaida Tsaryova, for example, huge, she's all over, she made films, right? Um, her husband, Rottenstein, was the artistic director of the theater until he gets ousted during Perestroika. No one knows when he died. There's like two death dates, and no one quite knows what happened to her. Like, there's a story that she left the theater in 1994 because her salary got cut and cursed the theater. And like, everybody kind of says like, oh yeah, Dekhtaryova cursed the theater. I'm like, well, did, did she really curse the theater? Like, how did she leave? Why did she leave? And no one knows. There's no archival trace of her. So what do you do? And clearly there's something there, but there's no archival trace. And so I think that that is one of the challenges dealing with actresses actually with Soviet actresses and it's a methodological issue I'm dealing with a lot in um, in my comrade actress book and have, have used a lot of really wonderful scholars um, like Antoinette Burton for example Susan Bennett who look at what do you do when you only have a small source and and who are we to judge the smallness of that source and the smallness of this story and how do we bring up those voices um, uh, because those those stories that we don't have sources for and those stories that may not be told may be just as important. So that's something I'm working on. Great. Uh, Leander uh, would like to ask a question as well. It's related, uh, so I'll go to him next. Great. Um, okay, sorry, can you hear me? My webcam is off, I'm not feeling well. Um, it's not a question um, and you don't have to respond. I'm providing suggestions. Uh, first of all, I think what you said was very interesting. I'm looking at it from a historiographical perspective. Um, and the place of stories in the narrative is a sort of a trans-historical topic. I mean, you got in American history, the famous article by William Cronin, A Place for yeah. Stories. You know, in Chinese history, I can, you know, recommend some practitioners or talk about it. So mm -hmm. uh, that's very interesting, you know, um, perhaps position a book. 
So the second point is, I don't like the term periphery. Uh, that often is political. Um, you know, in uh, Chinese history, there are historians, a minority, who celebrate in the the the, the marginalized periphery. But I'm in favor of decentering, and I don't like periphery because it's a loaded term. In fact, Paul once called me professor of decentering history or something like that. Uh, uh, our colleague Paul Croce. So, so you know, um, that could be the periphery. I think is a very loaded term. I think you know what you're trying to say is that this stuff matters. Right, yes. and so it's yeah. more decentering or multiple centers. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's because of my libertarian leanings. Okay, so that's the second thing. Third thing, I was struck by many of the things you said. Um, uh, yes, I understand, uh, uh, Katya, and in, in, in I'm, I'm kind of like with Mayhem on this, uh, even though it's not a pre-planned conspiracy. Okay, so um, <laughs> so anyway, um, but um, I, I was struck by you know I you probably come across the genre micro history which originally mm -hmm. was Italian so many of the things you said history of everyday life uh, smaller source base or non-existent source base and things like that and you know it's um, these are all features of uh, micro history right you know Carlo Ginzburg you know and I'm, I'm not sure I'm not familiar what uh, who the practitioners are in Soviet and uh, Russian history so I don't know whether you could bring that up a bit more and then position mm -hmm. yourself because it just seems like a very good fit the kind of things you want to argue like decentering the source base that these people have forgotten the stories and you know the micro macro link i mean there's a purpose to all these stories right that you're telling not just because they're forgotten i mean we don't want to know all the stories like i wouldn't want to know some of trump's stories you know but um you know what i'm saying so yeah i think micro history would be interesting thank you Awesome. Thank you so much, Sandra. Those are really great comments. Thank you. Uh, Martin? Hi, yeah. Can you guys hear me and see me? Yes, we can. Yeah, hey. Hey, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mayhill. Just uh, uh, what I wanted to add in as, a, as, a, as someone who's studying um, the 1980s, uh, the Soviet yes. 1980s in great detail, I, you know, I I also want to, um, you know, echo the idea that, yeah, that what the, the, this story definitely matters out there, and for me, it really matters because of uh, the story you tell about about uh, the sort of ideological confusion there uh, surrounding uh, the celebrations of 1985 and the uh, yeah. and the 40th anniversary of the war. Um, it, it's like there's this real crescendo. Like we must celebrate it. We must bring back all these stories and these which which nobody can really identify with. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's like so long ago, yeah. um, and I was wondering um, what what you know what we were talking about earlier was like. Well, this uh, this 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 theater survives the the collapse of the Soviet Union, and it go, and you tell that story in the paper. And I'm wondering, um, you know, if, if in the book idea um, whether whether this period from from eighty five to ninety one, like what happens during that? There's like a real um, uh, sort of uh, you know, a moment when there can be all sorts of explorations that take place. And, and I just, I just, you know, we had this one chapter and I'm wondering if, if, if how the Gorbachev era shows up in your book or the idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's like such a great question. I would love to talk to you more about the eighties actually, cause I really normally don't do the eighties. And so this is all really new for me. Um, yeah. So, um, this guy Rottenstein has run the theater, uh, from 67 um, and he goes on Komandorovka in 86 and while he's gone they do perestroika in the theater and oust him and and then there's sort of a rotating chair of directors Rosenstein actually still is on the artistic council and like still giving ideas um because he sort of has nowhere to go um and they can't find a repertory they suffer in perestroika right they can't find a repertory um they they can't decide on anything. Um, they have this younger generation coming up that wants to do different plays and the older generation won't leave. So there's a lot of tension. Um, so even before the collapse, they're dying. Um, they really don't don't do well in Pitasurica. Yeah, and I think for, for those in the, oh, in, in the audience, I mean, there's a lot in your paper there about about uh, what's happening, you know, in the now with the war in the Donbas, and and I think you know things have changed a lot in Ukraine these last years, but there is this always this sense in Lviv that 
um, this is Western Ukraine, and like they, there people in like Western Ukraine really never did, you know, for 20 odd years there just didn't have much to do at all with the Donbass. So it was might have might as well have been Mars out there. And so uh, you know, there's this really this sense of like, yeah, we got to understand who these miners are. I mean, if you're looking looking at the current the current stories about the current war. Mm-hmm. I was intrigued about a lot about what you had to say there about there being no language about courage or character or morality in these in these uh, movies. Uh, it was ah. uh, as in like this was like a terrible a, a, a atrocious set of events that were taking place. We've been invaded by Putin and and there's no we have to defend ourselves and it's been a very ugly six years there where people have been. Uh, as you say, creating creating the narrative all the way through, like we are right now here in this country with COVID. Um, do all the chapters sort of end that way with you bringing the story to the to the to the to, to right now? No, I mean it's meant to be sort of a chronological book. Um, I'm a boring historian that way, and so um, and so uh, this la- the it ends the last chapter Soviet Ghosts actually is about the post-Soviet, the 1991 to whenever I finished the book. Um, And I think what's interesting about the theater today is um, certainly with, in public discourse, there is a narrative, it's a war with Russia, it's a war against Putin, it's the war with Russia. But interestingly, a lot of um, culture is about how it's also a war with us. And even this blockbuster film, Cyborgs, Heroes Never Die, that Natalia Borosby, which is a blockbuster, huge state-funded movie. It's about these heroes who, who survived the siege at the Donetsk airport. But much of it is about like, hey man, like we're the same people. Like we're fighting each other. The war is here, you know. Um, and, and in Bad Roads too, I mean, it really is about, there's no Russians at all. It's really about like, um, what's happening to a community, what's happening to a country, the bad choices we make, which I think is really interesting, right? It's this very sort of, in, you know, what is it about our society? What is it about us that we're, that we're at this war that is so, um, that is transforming us so much? So it's, so that's really interesting to me, right? Um, sort of a multiplicity of narratives. Thanks. Thanks, Mia. Thank you, Martin. Okay, uh, we have two more people waiting with their hands up, and Eric, I believe, was first, and then Paul. So, Eric. Thank you, uh, Melinda, and thank you, Mayhel, for this fascinating paper. I did read the paper, which is obviously awesome. even even more nuanced and detailed than your presentation, and there's so many different important things going on. I'm, I'm just going to ask one question awesome. that has to do with gender. Um, I'm wondering both in terms of the actual history and then the representation of history in popular culture, military history, whether there's a distinction or a difference between how ethnic Ukrainians viewed women in the military and the role of women in the military and at least Soviet era Russians, because I'm thinking as a case study about the night witches Mm. who were celebrated, not just in reality, um, I mean, even Germans talked about them, but also in film, as I recall, in the 70s and 80s. And, and I think one of the Night Witches actually made her own film. And it, and it seems that a subtext here is that the Ukrainians don't care about women in the military except as objects. Or, you know, they're sexual. I mean, the, the positive stories are about men, not women as fighters or self-determining. Is that just anecdotal or is there a distinction there? between Ukrainian yeah. and Soviet representations. Totally, okay, so let me pull that apart. So first of all, um, I think the distinction would be between pre-1939 Soviet women of all ethnicities who then were served in the war and pre-1939 Ukrainian women in Poland who were in the underground. Does that make sense? Like that would be the distinction. Right. Sure, but a lot of that, I mean, the Night Witches were in the 42, 43, and then their representations were thereafter. Right, so, but again, the Night Witches were multiple ethnicities, right? Right. So, and what's interesting about the Night Witches, actually, we have two students here, Lee and Eve. I'm so glad you guys are here. 
One of the reasons I can answer Dr. Kurlander's question is that actually a student of ours, Kaylee Concanon, several years ago did her spree senior research on representations of the night witches. Okay. Yeah, and actually what she found was super interesting that right after the war, they were very, um, realistic isn't quite the right term, but um, um, depictions of the night witches that depicted them as fighters, right? Absolutely. They were super cool and super important. And as you move towards the late Soviet period, and she looked at an interesting TV serial in the post-Soviet period, they were much more feminized, like they were about their makeup and their hair, and um, there was a focus on the love stories and like de-emphasizing their military victories, um, which obviously was like very interesting. And I think um, the really interesting thing that your question brings up actually is, again, Ukrainian women who weren't in the Soviet army, but were fighting in um, the underground. Um, and I mentioned briefly my colleague, Marta Havreshko, who has worked specifically on um, sexuality of those women and the ways that in the underground, um, many women's role was, was sex, right? To have a relationship with someone in the Red Army, um, which would essentially be a suicide mission, right? You would gather intelligence and then at a certain point, the underground would come in and kill you both, right? Um, and if they didn't kill her, other other partisans or, or, the, or the village would. Um, or to um, gather intelligence, but also serve service um, a male member of the underground, right, as a field wife. Um, and so, um, and those stories are not told, right? Do not talk about that, right? And so, um, I think this sort of the roles that women played in the underground, they're very much heroized and, you know, martyrs to the cause of the Ukrainian nation. Um, but the ways that everyday women, um, what they did to serve the underground is, is not something that is touched and certainly not touched in theater. Um, and I think that's a very um, interesting um, interesting story and my, you know, you can even move further west. I have a colleague, Anna Muller, who wrote about Polish women um, in the underground and their experiences in prison. And those stories are gone, right? That, that actually these Polish women were very, very important in the Armia Krajowa and, um, and, and they've become sort of mythologized. And with the myths, you lose the real story, right? right? Thank you. So, thank you. This is such a cool exchange, thank you. Um, so we have two more uh, people that would love to ask you a question, um, and then I think we'll probably be close to the edge of our time. Uh, so Paul and then Snezhana. Okay, thank you. Thank you, May Hill, for this fascinating presentation and a real education for those of us who aren't, don't focus on this material. And um, I gather that the figures who stopped Telling good stories, as you put it, were 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 those who were very wedded to the military entertainment complex, as you put it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's a fair fair listening, fair reading. Okay. And then, um, were were there stories from the authorities like this that did get popular? Because after all, in other times and places, powerful voices, even if promoting fakery or fake news. Uh, have been able to produce popular narratives. Do you see examples like that in your material? Yeah, I mean, certainly this, for example, um, the play I showed the pictures of Barabanchitsa, I mean, that was performed all over the Soviet Union. Um, it mm -hmm. became a tele movie, like a filmed thing. Very, pro It's actually being performed today in Moscow, I mentioned in the paper. So, mm -hmm. um, Yes, a lot of these plays, um, the play that Katya referenced, The Dons Are Quiet Here, huge cultural resonance. Interestingly, Sashka, which I talked about, was on the small stage, so a smaller thing. But even today, when I mentioned to colleagues in Lviv in theater that, oh, I'm you know, working on this piece on Sashka, the comments I get are, oh, Shikarna Vastava, what a wonderful show. Or, oh, mm. who was that actor? Pachomov, he was so good. Oh, I loved that. Oh, <laughs> forever to get to. You know, so there is this actually even this play that I think is quite schematic, you know, it certainly for the Lviv theater crowd, 
they were going and it resonated, right? And they liked it, mm -hmm. thought it was well done. So yeah. I think maybe that's that's something interesting, right? That even though a narrative is an official narrative, it doesn't mean it's not, it doesn't mean people don't get something from it and it doesn't mean those narratives don't spread. Mm -hmm. It's just they stop spreading at a certain point, right? Um, and With our, the ones coming top down. From the authorities, yeah. And I think mm -hmm. um, I mentioned this in the paper that there's something, you know, when you think about Barabanchitsa, right? A, about this sort of recently liberated um, town. I mean, those are towns in Western Ukraine. Like this play is being performed in Western Ukraine in towns that where the Gestapo was there and people were like working with the Gestapo and working against the Gestapo. Um, and so you kind of think, well, God, like how could this play have had an audience? And a couple of theater people made a comment to me that was like, well, everyone had been through the trauma of war. And so it didn't really matter what the story was. They could find themselves in the story. Mm -hmm. and, and the act of sitting in a theater and seeing a play about war, when you've been through this trauma, actually was, was quite, you know, there's a reason that the theater gained an audience. That changes by the 80s, right? Because everybody in the theater and in the cast hasn't survived World War II. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, I think there's a piece about this, this trauma of war that, you know, no one talks about, right? That concept of PTSD didn't exist, right? And kind of the enormity of, of what this experience has been, um, and certainly the experience in Western Ukraine of multiple occupations and then a new, you know, now we're becoming Soviet. Um, so there's something about, about theater that is able to bridge that gap in this early period. And then, and then it changes, right? And, and we'll so see if I can figure that out. <laughs> your mission, should you decide to accept. Yeah. So the, the war served as a not only a unifying agent in general, but but solidifying for the for the yeah. government narrative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. um, the government is people too. The government had all served in the war, right? You sure. People who are coming to Lviv to set up Soviet power, they they mm -hmm. get that job because mm -hmm. they served in the war. Yeah. So. So it's kind of yeah, mm -hmm. and even even uh, your references in the paper and in, in the presentation to Shaska. Uh, how did you put it, expressing Soviet humanist ideals or morals yeah. or something like that? That's that's also a, a government expression, right? That's a, that's, that's a party line. It's, it's a stock phrase, Soviet humanism. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's like, a party. Yes. He's our man. So it's not just it's not just people are excited about him at, in terms of his acting that the authorities are excited about him because he's preaching the party line. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank Interesting. You. We'll take that to other times and cultures. Yeah. Such yeah. insights. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, Snezhana. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, Michael, first of all, um, thank you for this presentation, for the paper. I read it. I gulped it. It was so uh, great. Yeah, so gripping. Uh, and I actually, uh, well, I don't know uh, how much my uh, question is um, relevant, but the, my other questions were actually asked before. Like, for example, like Martin asked the question. Yeah. But, so, but I still am interested. In the end, you mentioned uh, a new Russian film, uh, Beam yeah. Pool. Yeah. And uh, there is also a, a, a rather new film of 2015. I don't know if you know about this. Uh, indestructible in, in Islam oh. in Ukrainian and in Russian it's called beat for the Sevastopol the battle for Sevastopol ah. and actually it's a Russian Ukrainian film about Lyudmila uh, Pavlyuchenko a famous oh, yeah. sniper uh, and um, so uh, that film is more in the lines of Azoris Destichy don't mm. right here about a hero woman figure in, in war and being Paul Builder is about um, this ugly untold taboo uh, yeah. story and topics uh, for the war and uh, both films have their audiences and uh, uh, being Paul got a prize yeah. uh, in, in Kane. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. And the um, it was Sevastopol actually um, became very famous because of the actors and the song, the, it's a clone story. So I was wondering um, uh, what, um, what do you think the theater 
would um, turn uh, recently more into the, uh, the topics like you mentioned in this film. And by the way, like a little more, can you, you just mentioned it in the very last moment, paragraph, this film. So could you tell more, a little bit more what you think about it and how you think it applies to the whole book project and uh, films like uh, that one about Pavlyuchenko, so like like night witches, all the uh, uh, heroic stories of women being in war or uh, uh, dawns. Yeah, like so I think that's um, it's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, so um, Pavlyuchenko is really interesting, and actually, I I heard a talk about her um, about how. Um, when you actually look at her real story, it's completely different from the way that it's narrated. And um, that she actually wasn't, she was a famous sniper for people who don't know. And, um, and that she was much more traumatized than um, is, is sort of talked about. Um, she may have been pregnant at a certain point. Um, and, and that her kind of the real story is like actually really much more interesting but it's definitely been sort of created into this sort of narrative of this amazing woman sniper. Um, so I think that's actually really, really interesting. Again, this sort of creating of a myth versus the reality. And I think what's interesting about Lilda Bingpol is um, it is this kind of, that there's a way that when, when you look at the, the real experiences of women, which often have to do with sex and loss um, and death and children, it, it erases the myth, right? And I think there's this thing that, that Bigelow is trying to do with that film of getting past the myth somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and I think that's a real, interesting question of why we need um why we need myths and why we need heroes and can we talk about war without having myths and heroes um so uh yeah so that's great i'll watch that movie yeah and actually i'm thinking of showing it uh, and watching it with students but i think of those two films as just actually what you're talking about the soviet inheritance versus the new age, the the the, yeah. the influence, yeah. you know, Western influence. You know, it's like that yeah. clash that started yeah. in like 2014, yeah, earlier. Awesome. Great, thank you. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Snejana. Um, I have a question as well, but we are running up against the college meeting, which I want to be mindful yeah. of. So I'm gonna send you my question by email. Um, and I want to encourage other people to do the same thing. Um, you know, these spotlight sessions can be so wonderful for us to get the feedback. And that's really what I'm hoping for Mayhill. And it's already happened in spades. So congrats, Mayhill, for a wonderful session uh, and great job organizing. Uh, this Thank year. you. Thank you so much, you guys. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye.